I interviewed this woman and I thought I was going to put it on YouTube. And I swear to God, you guys, she talks about so many personal things. I can't put it on the internet. I can't. And I didn't have my engineer to help me. So I did it myself and I didn't, the sound levels are off. I've literally spent like four hours editing this video. So guess what? I'm not putting on YouTube. It's just for you guys. So I'm going to put it on my program and, um, yeah, there's a lot of personal stuff on here. She was talking about names and people I know because she's in my town. I didn't know her, but there's a lot of similarities anyway. But there were huge chunks where she didn't say words, so I had to go in through it and edit it out and delete it. And it's just been like, ugh. And then I'm like, you know what? It's just meant for your ears. I hope you enjoy it. I'm so happy. Okay, so I'm just going to share with everybody what happens. As you know, my name is Lori, Lori McDermott. I am the wife expert at thewifeexpert.com. And I literally stalk people. Because years ago, I used to go out and gather information of people who have been married, divorced, got back together. You know, something happened. Everybody has a story. And so today I have a guest with me who is amazing. And this is what happened. This is how I met her. So I volunteer my time sometimes because, you know, doing this kind of work gets kind of emotional. And I kind of help out with the city where I live which is an amazing city. You got to come here. I live by the beach in California. And the city of Manhattan Beach, every Christmas does this holiday sleigh thing where Santa rides the sleigh and they go from neighborhood to neighborhood. So I volunteered to go on the sleigh and I met this lady. And so I get people up the sleigh, see Santa down the other side with a bunch of other helpers, little elves. I'm looking at this woman and I said, are you ready to see Santa with your dog? And she goes, yes, that guy over there, that's my ex-husband but we're dating now. And I thought, okay, how many people on the planet would come into the situation? This happens to me all the time, random places, as you all know. So I meet Donna and Donna tells me all about in our five minute stop where we get kids on and off and adults with their dogs. I got her phone number and I said, I have to talk to you. So the deal is I don't know Donna's story. This is the first time I'm asking her because I like to be surprised like you. So Donna, hi. Why don't you go ahead and tell me what year you got married? How about let's start there. So we were married in 1994 and lived in this beautiful city for 30 years. Married 28, two beautiful daughters that we raised here. And mm. one went off to Italy. The other one graduated with her master's working happy and in, she's engaged and so my husband just at the time decided he wanted a divorce when we had all this ability to spend time together and live the rest of our life happily ever after so so the kids like were like almost launched right everyone's yeah. going away and you are like yay me and husband um, off together so we were like free birds together and I went to Italy to help our daughter get settled in Italy and I came home from Italy I got quarantined there for 30 days so because my daughter had COVID so this was in 21 and so I come home and he enjoyed his time for a month okay so, so we sold our beautiful home and I escaped to Florida for a year and a half so wait, wait, back up. So so back then you come home from this trip and he says to you, I want a divorce. Yeah. He said, I promise I'll make it easy on you, but I just want a divorce. And really no concrete reason. Just, I guess he was going through a midlife crisis. And I said, no, we're not getting divorced. Uh -uh. No, this isn't going to happen. So I tried for three weeks to like give him a back rub every night and convince him how wonderful I was. But that didn't work. And so we ended up getting divorced and going through a mediator, sold our house very quickly. And I felt like my heart was ripped in two and I really still loved him and missed him terribly, but I had to get away. I went to Florida. My brother had moved to Clearwater Beach. And so I moved there and um, had a couple different jobs. I'm a nurse. And so I tried to move on with my life and he stayed in Manhattan Beach and rented an apartment down by the water. And he went to Florida with our, or went to Italy with our daughters last Christmas. And just, he seemed so happy. And I cried the whole month of December last year. And then um, 
I joined Match.com and I tried to move on. And then in the spring, I came back to um, see our daughter that lives here and babysit her dog. And in May, he called me up while I was babysitting the dog. And he said, 10 o'clock at night, my daughter was out of town. And he said, I think I need to come over and check on Cleo. I think grandpa needs to make sure Cleo's okay. And I said, That's the dog. The dog. <laughs> and I said, well, I think Cleo's okay, but if you want to come over, okay. So I took a jacket and covered up the camera out front. And I, Why'd I said, you do that? Because my daughter has cameras everywhere. <laughs> it was my daughter's house I was staying at. Why would she Torres. be upset if dad came over? Because she would be upset and she was upset when she found out because daddy was coming over and her mommy was there babysitting the dog why was she upset by that <laughs> because daddy screwed over mommy and screw screw dad yeah. he's not coming over mm. yeah she didn't want her father taking advantage of her mother mm. so, so you covered the camera so your daughter wouldn't see what you guys were doing that's hilarious so he left, okay he left at four o'clock in the morning and i told him i'm like you better cover up that camera because we sat wait 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 he, he went home at four o'clock in the morning. There's a lot of details missing here. <laughs> well, we just talked and snuggled a little bit. What did he say? Did he say he missed you? Yes. Yeah. He missed me. And he, he really was very affectionate and passionate and really realized that this was not what he wanted was to live alone the rest of his life. Hmm. He didn't cover up the camera. And he left and he walks on the beach every morning at 6 a.m. He walks for about two and a half hours. He walks between 18,000 and 2,000 steps every morning along the wow. beach. So he gets a phone call at 6 a.m. from our daughter who's out of town. And she saw him on the camera. And she's like, what the hell were you doing at my house? <laughs> Mom's there. Why were you there? And so she didn't talk to either one of us for several weeks. <laughs> And then I go back to Florida. We continue to talk for several months back and forth and text. And so then I came back to California and didn't tell anybody. And I didn't tell anybody we were seeing each other again. But my daughter proceeded to tell my best friends that I had some romantic time with her father. And she was so mad. She called both of my best friends and she was really, really upset. And she called my other daughter, our other daughter, and she was extremely upset that we were dating. And they both felt that he was doing this only because he was using me. For what? What was he using you for? Get a back rub. That's it? Yeah, that's what they mm. thought. They thought that dad was just wanting me around to have a good time and to have somebody there for him when he was needing affection and love and, mm -hmm. and sex. And that was the only reason that he wanted to see me. And what do you think it was? I think he truly missed me. And I could feel that when we were together. Mm -hmm. You and know. I knew in my heart. And I set boundaries. And believe you me, when we started dating again, I was swimming with my life jacket on. I didn't want to get hurt either. Mm. And I wasn't, I really didn't talk to anybody. And I took about six months to really try to feel what I wanted. And I continued to date. Um, and I just kind of really, I prayed a lot. And I put myself in God's hands. And I knew that I wanted him back. And I knew that in the first place, I was his gift. I was his gift that God gave him. And he Amen. <laughs> That's the attitude. Yes. <laughs> yes. You were a gift. You are a gift. Mm -hmm. And his daughters were his gift from God. Mm -hmm. And he, he really realized that after he lost me. And he is... <laughs> He's a narcissist. And Aren't they all? He would never admit it. When I first found out he wanted a divorce, when other people found out, I have the most amazing girlfriends. And I had six books at my front door within a week. <laughs> and I read a lot. I went to... Were they to, Were they like, when he said he wanted a divorce, were they like, get out? Or were they like, yeah. wait, let's see what happens. Maybe he's having a crisis and we should slow things down. Both. What were the, what, what was their both. attitude? I got, both. I got both. I got... Um, a really good friend that's a nurse practitioner 
and she's like, you should have left him years ago. This is just what you need. Run for your life. And then I got other women that are like, just slow down. You're gonna like, he's gonna come back to you. And then I went to a women's retreat at the church. To, I went to a cornerstone retreat. Oh, martyrs. That's where I go to church. I didn't even know that. Yeah. <laughs> That's American martyrs. If anyone lives in Los Angeles, great oh, church, great God. church, wonderful community. Cornerstone's amazing. Okay. So you did that. And so that was the best thing that I've ever done. Mm. In my, and I mm. learned so much about myself and my relationship with God and just to really let God and let go. Mm-hmm. You know, and I right. learned how to breathe that and to feel that and to know that. And so when I let Tony back into my life and I could hear him talking about intimacy versus having sex, I realized that who you've been talking to. <laughs> so we need to back up. So back, back, back. So when you, I've got questions and I know my, my listeners will as well. So I want to cover some things. So back when you were moving your daughter to Italy, was there anything going on in your marriage? Did you notice Tony getting a little bit off a little bit? Like had something happened in his life that might have put him in a place where he was struggling? So there were several things. And so an entire 12 months previous to that, there were several things that had happened and things weren't good. But I mean, things weren't great. And I had decided that I wanted to change in our marriage. I wanted a better marriage and I didn't want a divorce because the same therapist friend of mine, she had told me just to get out, just to run a year before that. And so I had really tried hard to make things different. And I tried negotiation. I had read a book about negotiation. It's like, okay, well, if you want to have sex tonight, well, okay, you're going to rub my back for 15 minutes. <laughs> and the one thing, and then it gets a little deeper, but the one thing that I learned from that, you don't negotiate with a narcissist. Hmm. And then he started going to, he quit his job a couple of years prior to that. He just decided he didn't want to work anymore. He's done. And financially, that wasn't a great thing for him to do. He didn't talk to me about it. He just did it. So he had known that we had a lot of equity in our home, but you can't live off the equity. In you your can't home. eat with equity. <laughs> you can't buy steaks with equity. Yeah. Hmm. So he just kind of ignored all that and then he started going every single day to the bar every day he was going to Hennessy's he was coming home completely intoxicated so I, I was trying to get him to walk on the beach and you know let's go to dinner let's do something different you know and the girls tried also when they were around and it just you know nothing really changed his mind he was you know determined to go and do you know he had been very involved in our daughter's life she played the oldest one she played softball for 12 14 years he, my husband's greek she played softball and international Greek softball team. Wow. She got a scholarship at a D1 softball college and his whole life, his whole being was wrapped around softball. And so when she moved out and stopped playing softball, there was a void in his life. Yeah. A huge void. That was it. He decided that he needed to fill that void with something else and he just got home. Oh, we got home now. Are we okay? <laughs> Oops, we can pause. Do you want to go to a different room? Or what should we do? Yeah. Yeah. All right. We can do that. Can you go to your bedroom? Yeah. <laughs> We're good. I think the story is fascinating. And um, yeah, it's hard. You don't know anything about me. You really don't. But I went through the same thing. And it's tough. Yeah. Did your husband do men's cornerstone yet? No. Mm. And he he wouldn't. And I I love for him too because we played softball. He got to meet a lot of the men that 
were at um, martyrs. Mm -hmm. and, That's um, good. That's good for men. Men need other men to really realize how good their life really is. Yeah. Because once you start talking to other men, someone has a worse story than you. You know, we're covering names. I'll cut this out, but yes. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. They tried to um, help. Tried to... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rob knows yeah. my husband too. And back when this happened to me in 2013, I was just like, hey, <laughs> I don't know, Laura. Yeah, it was awful. But I'm sure now he's what he's like, well, Brad, he's we've got a whole slew of people around here that have gone through this. But the trick is, or the thing is, yours came out of it. Okay, so now, so let's go back to it. So now that you're settled, um, your husband just came home and you've had to relocate, which is very kind of you. So obviously what happened was he got really upset. You know, he lost his daughter. And there's this thing when your child moves out, it's like you, suddenly you're like, I'm alone. Even though he has you, it's like, I'm that old guy. Now I got nothing. I'm going to be dead soon. Now I need to live. So now he tells you, I want a divorce. And so you're fine. You're like, okay, let's do this divorce thing, but I don't want it. During those three weeks that you said you were kind of like, hmm, how was it right away when he said he wanted a divorce? Did you move out right away or did you stay there? No. You massaged his back for a while and then you went to Florida. So this was in um, September. 2021. So, yeah. Okay. And so I, so um, we stayed living together and then um, our daughter, Jenny came back with me. And then, so she was here for a month and then she left and then he wouldn't go to therapy. It doesn't work by the way, when they want a divorce, cause they're on the zone, no therapy is going to help. He can do individual therapy, but yeah. couples therapy just doesn't work. So then we spent three weeks, had the best sex we'd had since pre-children. And then he was leaving one day to go to Hennessy's and I'm like, are you going to put your wedding ring back on? Because I had real hopes that we were going to work it out. And he looked at me like I had six eyeballs. He's like, no. What am I doing? So then I cut him off. So then he started sleeping downstairs and I was sleeping upstairs. So that was the end of that. And so we okay. stayed together, living in the same house, but separate lives until we sold the house, which was in um, April. Wow. And okay. What was that like? I just kept my mouth shut, didn't talk to him. He actually, in December, I traveled. I left a lot. In January, I went to Florida. I would, so from January until we sold the house, I was gone almost all the time in Florida. And then I officially left after we sold the house and drove to Florida. So selling the house, that's like a big deal. You guys had that house for what, 25 years? He had it 40 years. Why did he want to sell the house? To get the money. To do what? To get drunk every day. Did he say, I'm going to sell the house and move to... He wanted to stay in Manhattan Beach. And you know, because we had had to refinance the house, put his job and stuff. So I mean, financially, we were not that well off. And I'm a nurse and we had to refinance the house a few times. By the time we paid taxes, when we sold it, he got, he had nothing no retirement, no nothing. He got half my retirement, half whatever I had in 401ks. And then on top of that, I had to give him back some money he put in the house from his mom when his mom died. Oh. But I had oh. a really good attorney that I spoke with. And then we went through mediation. And then after mediation, I went back to the attorney and he said, I did really good because I would have had to pay him uh, support the rest, of the rest of his life because you had a job and he quit. I know he really supported, but you hear his side of the story. It's completely personalized. Of course. What was his side that he supported you every? Yeah. Yeah. But until he didn't. Anyway, I mean, if you look at his social security report, he never made much money. Yeah. But anyway. So yeah, I'll, I'll cut this out. Don't worry. But the um, he knew that financially we couldn't stay there unless we did something but he wouldn't listen to me because i had it i had it planned out where we could have stayed there i had a plan yeah okay he and didn't want to hear it no but he he was $55,000 in credit card debt he was spending about six or seven thousand dollars a month 
going. Was that after you got divorced or prior? No, before. Oh, no. Okay. Crazy. Yeah. Fast forward, sell the house, divide everything up. And I didn't want anything. Got rid of everything. Yeah. I didn't want How did that feel? It feels so good. Yeah. So it, Great. it feels so good. So I moved to Florida. And then when I decided to come back to California, I went to South Africa for three weeks with a friend. And then he flew to Florida and we took a three week trip cross country. Who? You and the guy from? No, me and my husband. Ex -husband. You and your husband. Okay. So when was that? What year so was that? Just now, just a few months, a month okay. ago. So he flew to Florida um, in um, November and well, actually the end of October, I got back from South Africa. And so we stayed a few days in Clearwater, then we went to St. Augusta, and then we went to um down to uh Key West. This was just this year. So from the time that so you guys kind of went in was that March of 2022 or no, uh May, June? May uh we, we sold the house in May of 21. 21, okay. Wow. So the divorce and then was final in September 21. And then in that was a, almost a year from the year before when you took your daughter to school, which was 2020. Okay. I'm following the timeline now. So, okay. So from a year from, I want a divorce to a year to, later, it was final. That's so quick. Yeah. Okay. And then now you're separated and you're doing your own thing. And he, that whole time you guys were divorced and you were elsewhere. Did he reach out to you ever or was it completely silent? How did you survive that time? I have good, good friends. In Florida or here? Both, both. And they supported you. Okay. Yeah. And my brother, I have, my brother is just, he's been amazing. This is what I have to, I, cause I know people are going to want, how do you, does that happen? And you go, I'm not going to call him. I'm not going to text him. Like, did you fight yourself some nights? Oh Yeah. Oh yeah, I and, cried myself to sleep, and instead of calling him or texting him, I would call my friends or turn on the TV or read a book. Or okay. Write in my journal or try to remember what an asshole. Try. he is. <laughs> But he wasn't always an asshole. He just became one. Back then, when you told your daughters you were getting divorced, were they just like, "Wait, what?" Well, by that point, they were both like. Well, you guys haven't been happy for a long time. Oh, okay. And that surprised me. Hmm. It didn't surprise him, but. I think sometimes women just live in their own cloud, right? Like I'm okay. You guys all must be okay. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it until somebody decides I'm not okay. And they start pulling the attention. Yeah. And maybe your daughter's noticing you just didn't. Yeah, well, it happens to a lot of people. Throughout the years, there were, I believe you me, there were a few, um, few times when he would be intoxicated and upset, and you know, say mean things to me, mm -hmm. and I tended to be Pollyanna and ignore them until one night. This was maybe 15 years ago and he called me the C word mm. and you can do anything but call me the C word because mm -hmm. that well, I don't deal with the C word so you spoke I up to, that was it I took a brand, brand new car I wrote because I could tell him to leave I'm like just go to your mom's call an Uber leave just just get out of the house because he wouldn't shut up so I took his brand new car Parked it in the alley, left it running, put all the windows down, went into the house, pulled the red cord on the garage door, went upstairs, and I'm like, you want your brand new Lexus? It's in the alley. It's running. All the windows down. So if you want to keep it before somebody steals it, you better go get it. So he left, and I barricaded all the doors. By then, the girls were awake, and I would not let him back in the house. And told him to go to his mother's. And they, they remember that night. And that was pretty terrifying. Yeah. Well, good for you. Set up for yourself. But other than that, 
And there were a few times throughout the years I would have a friend or two tell me, you should not allow him to talk to you like that. And you shouldn't allow the girls to see the way that he talks to you. Mm-hmm. Because you don't want them growing up thinking it's okay for a man to treat you like that. Because they're going to grow up thinking it's okay for a man to treat them like that. But what do you think about that? I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Mm-hmm. So I would try to say, hey, you know, that's not a nice thing to say to me. And I don't appreciate it. But maybe I should have stopped that conversation long before we got divorced. You know, I'm like, yeah, I am pretty Pollyanna. And, and so, yeah, but he was miserable and he was trying to bring you down and you chose not to interact with that. So now but. I think I'm a better partner because I, I do not tolerate that type of communication. And I've learned a lot about myself and I've learned how to communicate with him in a more effective way. And I won't tolerate any negative conversation, not just the C word, but anything. Yeah, <laughs> any- absolutely. Yeah. I want to, I want to be treated. And I, before, so he, when he came to Florida and got me and we spent three long weeks traveling across country and we, we had so much fun. We're really enjoying each other's company. And there was maybe just one time that um, there was like an issue or whatever. And I'm like, you know, that didn't make me feel good. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> good. But we just really are enjoying each other's company. And it's, yeah. You know, he calls it our hump across America trip. Yeah. So I, I want, I want people to understand. So like what happened to you in the beginning, right? So all those things that came up to the part where it started to get some frictiony. So I usually guide people through that time of friction when he's like, I'm out the door. You know, that is not the time to start communicating properly. That is the time to just shut up and leave him alone. It's when he comes back that you stand up and you say, I don't like how you're treating me. I don't like what you're doing. And this is how it's going to be in order for us to get along. But there's a bunch of words to say. And you did that. And I'm really proud of you because you survived that. And, you know, what I liked most about you when I met you is that huge smile you had on your face. You just seem to have this, like, positive attitude. And a positive attitude will get you everywhere. And how did you get that? Have you always had that? You know, there were times in my life I didn't and periods of sadness. And I just kind of decided, I think it's when I really turned my life over to God. Mm -hmm. And when I, you know, it's like, let God and let go, Mm -hmm. you know. Well, tell me what that means. How do you live that in your life? Well, I really believe in living in faith, not fear. And and when I get up in the morning, I meditate and I really believe that today's the day that God gave me and I'm going to let God work through me. And especially as a nurse, I just mm. always, when I've gone to work, I'm like, God, I give this day to you and I'm going to let you work through me as a nurse. And and I'm thankful and I'm grateful for everything that he does through me, you know, and I, 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 when I walk in the morning on the strand and I see people not smiling and I, I notice when I smile at them and they smile back, it makes me feel like I've made their day better and it makes my day better. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. So what advice would you give to women who might be struggling where you were in 2020, that whole year before you finally got divorced? What would you say to them? Or what would you, let's say, let's say this, if knowing what you know today, what would you say to yourself back then? That's so hard. It's so funny because I had a friend call me yesterday and kind of asked the same thing, like, and 
maybe things started changing when I just let go. When I didn't try and I'm like, you went out, go. See ya. Just go. See you later, alligator. And yeah. I separated myself. And then he realized that the grass wasn't greener on the other side. It's not. Those but brown I, roots, hecky things. Yeah. I don't know if that's the right answer for everybody. Let go? Yeah. What are you, What's the other choice? I don't know because I kept holding on and holding on and that didn't get me anywhere. So it wasn't until you actually let go that things started to work out. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? I think when I let, when, you know, in the beginning, it's like, no, if I let go, it's going to be over. I'm the only one hanging on. And like, you think you're the glue, which I think women in general are the glue. However, if you're holding on to something that wants to leave you, that phrase, if you let them go, they'll figure it out and they'll be back. But if you're hanging, it's almost like that magnet thing. If you're hanging on to it, it wants to get away. And the minute you go, bah, they go, ah, oh, well, this isn't any fun anymore. Nobody's chasing me and trying to pick me down. So it kind of it kind of works to your advantage to let someone go. And then it says how much of a value you are. Because if you believe in you and you know you have God on your side and you know you're a good person, bye. I know who I am. And if you don't want me, that's okay. Go figure out what you want. But I'm good because I like myself. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You're good. <laughs> yeah. So when you let go is when you get everything. Because there's some things that are just too big. I I was um I talk about how when I was driving over here, I live over by Miracosta on Meadows and I was going up this hill. And I was talking to God about how mad I was about some things. And I got a message, give him to me. This is too big for you. Give him to me. And so I literally was like, okay, take him because I can't handle it anymore. And it was then that things just started to happen because it was like, if you be quiet and you stay humble and you, you just don't try to fix everything because you can't, things just start to happen. If you have faith, faith in the outcome that things are going to be okay for you. Yeah. And it just works out. That helped me was creating a vision board. Mm. I like that. How did you hear about that? Like, did someone instruct you to do that? Yeah. I, well, I went to a workshop. Oh, for a vision board workshop? Mm -hmm. nice. I like that. Yeah. Do you have it? Where's your vision board? Um. It's downstairs in my stuff. I still have stuff in the garage that I haven't brought up yet. Okay. So what's on your vision board? What was most powerful about it? So my word for the day during the day that was created the vision board was love. Mm. And so I had a lot of love on the board and I had um, faith and um some rainbows I put on there. Yeah, no, that's great. That that that's really all there is is love. That's it. Like when they sit with the Beatles. What's the Beatles song? All you need is love. That's it. It's all you need. <laughs> There's not much else, right? If you have it and you can give it, you get it. You get it back. Okay. So, any more words that you want to share to the listeners that will hear this, um, who are going through something similar to yours? That you wanted just to say to inspire them i just i think it's just to have hope faith and love so i want to say something to you when you and tony get married again i would like to <laughs> well donna i am so grateful for your time today you have no idea how much i'm so happy this just means the world to me and your story will give the women who watch this a lot of hope to know that their husband yeah. will come home they just have to hang in there and do the right thing, what you're doing, what you did. I'm very excited for you. And I'll be looking into you and Tony as time goes on. Okay, you do that okay. anytime. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Donna. Thank we'll talk to you later. Okay. All right, so we can stay on for a couple of seconds. I'm just going to hit the recording. Oh, wait, I'm just going to end the meeting. We'll talk later on self. Bye, okay. honey. Bye. Bye.